Broadcasting from the Shepherd Ministry Studios in Scottsdale, Arizona, this is Shepherd Gathers with Pastor Scott Seidler. Hey, Shepherd family, this is Pastor Scott Seidler. Welcome to our last, final, ultimate, never to happen again in 2020 Shepherd Gathers Bible study. We're going to be finishing up the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at the final two chapters. We're going to be tying this thing in a bow. We are going to be putting it to bed. We are going to be laying it down. And we will have finished an entire almost year-long study of the book of Acts starting all the way back in April and continuing all the way to December. Um, I want to just recognize that um, we as human beings are really great at starting things. Typically, we are not really great at finishing things. Um, if you're a guy or even a gal, you may have a lot of home projects that you began, but you didn't quite finish. You may have some things that are on your honey-do list that you really have never gotten to. Can we just celebrate that we have gotten together through this pandemic of 2020 and we have studied from beginning to end patiently, methodically, constantly the book of Acts? Congratulations if you've been tracking all the way since April. And even if you haven't, whenever you started, thanks for sticking with us to the very sweet, not bitter, the sweet end of the book of Acts. I'm excited about this. I'm excited not just about Shepherd Gathers finishing the book of Acts. I'm also excited about what's coming on the other side of the New Year's holiday. We will be continuing these midweek Bible studies. And the thing that I think we're going to do, since we did so well with 28 chapters of Acts, we're going to study 16. 16 chapters in the book of Romans. Since the book of Acts ends with Paul in Rome, I figure why not study that consequential book, the great Magna Carta of Christianity, as it is called, the book of Romans, and read the gospel as presented by the Apostle Paul over the course of those 16 chapters. We're going to be doing it in a little bit of a different format, um, but nevertheless, it will still be good quality midweek teaching in the book of Romans. You may want to start reading it over the Christmas break for yourselves. An amazing book. Hey, I just also want to start uh, off tonight by uh, making a final pitch with This Shepherd Gathers. If you're listening to this, and uh, especially if you're part of our Shepherd family, would love for you to consider making a final year-end 2020 donation to our Shepherd family, to our Shepherd ministry. Um, this has been a hard year. Um, we have navigated it sufficiently. We have stewarded the financial resources that have been given to us, afforded to us by so many members here in Phoenix, Scottsdale, but also around the country. Thank you for those financial gifts. We want to continue to uh, make that appeal, however. As we look into 2021, great new ministry on the horizon, reestablishing in-person ministry with the vaccine, the therapeutics coming online. But we also want to continue these digital resources, not just for our in-person Scottsdale Phoenix family, but for sure for a worldwide distribution. There are Christians in our nation, around the world, who benefit from great Bible teaching that is focused on Scripture, anchored to the Lordship and authority of Jesus Christ. We want to make sure that that is well supported. So if you could go to our website, shepherdaz.church, there is a link, very obviously, for online donations. If you could be generous this Christmas, I'd be much appreciative of that and uh, look forward to getting after the ministry digitally of the gospel on the other side of our New Year's holiday. Well, the title for uh, this Shepherd Gathers is simply called The End is Only the Beginning. While we finish Acts chapter 28 tonight, we recognize that there is, as some have used the uh, imagery in Acts chapter 29. And as we study uh, this uh, 28th chapter, we would realize that we 
are the beginning of Acts chapter 29. We are the ones who are to carry the mission of the gospel that concludes with the Apostle Paul in house prisonment in Rome. Uh, we are the ones to carry it forward. We're going to be reading through as we've done now because these ending chapters of Acts are a little bit different in narrative form. We're just going to read as a group these two chapters. It may be a little bit tedious if uh, you want to just read them by yourselves without me reading them to you. That's okay. If you're listening to this while you're driving in your car, then just listen into the story. I'll try to read it as expressively as possible. But once we get on the other side of this, I'm going to conclude our study with several points that I think are the ultimate takeaways from the book of Acts 27 and 28. So here, here we go. Dial in. When the time came, Paul now is being sent. He sent sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment. That's not a small thing. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was Adramitium on the northwest coast of the province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at port along the coast of the province. The next day, when we docked at Sidon, Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so they could provide for his needs. Putting out to sea from there, we encountered strong headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. So we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland. Keeping to the open sea, we passed along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, landing at Myra in the uh, province of Lycia. There, the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us on board. We had several days of slow sailing. After great difficulty, we neared, uh, finally neared Canidus, but the wind was against us, so we sailed across to Crete and along the sheltered coast of the island past the Cape of Salmon. We struggled along the coast with great difficulty, finally arrived at Fair Havens near the town of Lacia. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall, and Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Men, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it, so they pulled up anchor, sailed close to the shore of Crete, but the weather changed abruptly. A wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island, blew us out to sea. The sailor couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. My goodness. We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Cauda, where the great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across to the sandbars of Sirtis off the African coast, so they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and stars until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me. Can you imagine Paul saying to these sailors, uh, men, you should have listened to me? Hmm, Paul, um, not smart. Paul called the crew together, said you should have listened to me in the first place, not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid. Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, as we were being driven across the Sea of Adria, sailors sensed land was near. 
They dropped a weighted line and found the water was only 120 feet deep, but a little later they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid they would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore, so they threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship, but Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just as the day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair on your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke it and peace, broke a piece of it and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat, all 276 of us who were on board. After eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. When morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors, let them in the sea, then they lowered the rudders, raised the foresail, and headed toward shore. But they hit a shoal, ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the ship stuck fast while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves. They began to break it apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul. So he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land. The others held on to planks or debris from the broken ship. So everyone escaped safely to shore. I'll just stop there for just a second in the reading of this and marvel with you at the detailed diary nature of this account. It, it is as if someone literally is writing every single day exactly what has happened. It's just a reminder that this is not... Um, a some made up account, but this is an eyewitness account of what is really happening in real time as Paul actually sails from one place to another, from imprisonment in Caesarea to trial in Rome. And uh, it's a reminder that this faith that we hold dear is a historical faith. It's not made up, it is anchored literally, it is anchored in actual ships and shipwrecks, boats and barnacles. And as Paul makes his way to Rome, um, we take heart that the ship of our own lives, um, that uh, God has created, manufactured, and by faith has redeemed, this ship is also being navigated, piloted, captained by our God, your God and Heavenly Father. Acts chapter 28, once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people on the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. The people of the island saw it hanging from his hand, said to each other, a murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake in the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead, but when they had waited a long time and saw he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided he must be a god. Neither the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to uh, Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us, treated us kindly for three days. As it happened, Publius's father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him, and laying hands on him, he healed him. Then all the other sick uh, people on the island came and were healed. And as a result, we were showered with honors. And when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods as its figurehead. Our first stop was Syracuse, where we stayed for three days. From there, we sailed across to Regium. A day later, a south wind began blowing, so following day, we sailed up the coast to Puteoli. There, we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming, and they came to meet us at the Forum on the Appian Way. 
Others joined us at the three taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. Let me just stop for a second, step away from that. Um, the church is growing. The church is expanding. And now we are on the peninsula of Italy, and we see that even outside of a great Roman city, there are Christian communities that are popping up everywhere. And Christian communities always look out for their own. Every church is to be a place that is hospitable for other Christians. When we arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging, though he was guarded by a soldier. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders. He said to them, Brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem, handed over to the Roman government, even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans tried me and wanted to release me because they found no cause for death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar, even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. I ask you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. They replied, we have had no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here, but we want to hear what you believe, for the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. So a time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God, tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures, using the law of Moses, the book of the, of the prophets. He spoke to them from morning until evening. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with his final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through the prophet, Go and say to this people, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear. And they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, their ears cannot hear, their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. We've done it. We read together the entire book of Acts. Thanks for being patient. I know those two chapters were very, very long. Now let me get to some teaching here and let me give you some final, uh, what do I got? Seven takeaways from this final two chapter stretch of the book of Acts. First of all, Paul is in Rome. He is awaiting Caesar's judgment, but it is not lost on me that there is a greater judgment. There is a greater judgment that is coming, and that greater judgment will be levied against all human beings by the judge, the one true judge. That is the God, the maker of heaven and earth. So while on the one side it would be easy for anybody, especially back in Paul's day as Luke, his companion is writing this book of Acts, it would be easy to feel pressure and weight, uh, the weight of knowing and believing that Paul was going to appear for judgment before Caesar, that that would be an overwhelming experience. But the fact is this, that Caesar will not have the final say. The courts of our land don't have the final say. Our parents, our friends, the people who set themselves as judges over us in our culture, in our daily lives, they do not have the final say about who we are, the value of our lives, where we're going, why we're going there. There is only one judge, and he holds the keys of life and death. Whatever happens with Paul, whether he lives or dies, he has already entrusted his life by faith to that great judge. And you and I should do the same. We don't know how the final chapter of our life will come. We do not know what the last pages will hold in terms of our life's narrative. But we do know this, that when the final point of punctuation is put, how about that? The final point of punctuation is put on the last page. There is a judge who awaits us in eternity. And that judge 
will make a judgment based on our deeds. But more than that, the obedience of our faith, faith that is focused and placed in the merit of Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, rose bodily from the grave, ascended bodily into heaven, and will come back at the last day to judge the living and the dead. You can put that in the bank. Uh, the second application point, persecution here in Acts chapter 28, it may be paused, but it won't end here. Uh, Paul, like so many Christians, gets a reprieve from the daily fight. But when all is said and done, we know that he will go in all likelihood as tradition holds to his death under the leadership and judgment of the emperor Nero. And that persecution would return to the church. Make no mistake about it, the church has its ebbs and flows, its ups and downs. But persecution is part of our vocabulary. Paul has experienced it repeatedly through the course of his three missionary journeys recorded in the book of Acts. You and I, in the missionary journeys we take each and every day, will face a measure of antagonism for the faith that we hold and the call of God on people's lives that we bring to others. Number three, we're in Rome and we're only in Rome. The ends of the earth await Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we remind ourselves, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As we will learn next year in 2021, as we study the book of Romans, Romans is preparatory for the ends of the earth. That book that Paul writes is meant to be a letter that precedes his arrival in Rome, so that as he arrives in Rome, he is ready to be launched launched beyond Rome across the Mediterranean Sea to France, to Spain, to the ends of the earth. Make no mistake, Paul may die in Rome, but that doesn't mean the mission of the gospel has an ending in Acts chapter 28. No, no, no. There are Christians who will carry out the mission. And as we know, in our 21st century moment, the gospel has gone out to the ends of the earth and is daily bearing fruit. Number three, number four, the Holy Spirit, still the captain of the ship. The Holy Spirit of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he was the one who brought Paul to faith. He was the one who led Paul on missionary journey number one, number two, number three. He's the one that gave Paul courage along with his companions to speak the gospel. This Holy Spirit has not abandoned Paul. He continues to work miraculous healings. He continues to work healing from venomous snake bites for Paul. He continues to lead Paul to give a testimony through two years of house imprisonment in Rome. And that Holy Spirit still works in and through us today in 2020 and in 2021 as well. We take heart and rest and courage and comfort and consolation in that Holy Spirit of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Number five, the diversity of nations represented in the church will only increase. You know, we have grown up in a predominantly ethnocentric set of churches in America. There are white churches, there are black churches, there are Hispanic churches, like attracts like. And and there's, that's fine. You know, we speak a common language. We eat common foods at the church potluck. We have common vis business ventures or places of employment, certain ways we raise kids, attend schools, watch television. I get all of that. That's just part of being culture like attracts like. But the reality is that as the Christian church continues to expand and progressively larger concentric circles, the diversity of nations that call the Christian church their spiritual home will increase. And we need to accept that. We need to accept the church, the fact that the church is not white, it's not yellow, it's not brown, it's not black or red or, or green or anything else, depending on what food you ate at a bad, a bad restaurant the other night. No, the church 
is multicolored, and because of that, it is multi-ethnic. It is multinational, just the way God wants it. And as Christians, one of the most challenging things and most beneficial things, challenging and beneficial things we can do, is to press into that multinational quality of the church. To get to see the church in different places and spaces of this community, of Phoenix or Scottsdale, Chicago, New York, of this world. People who do Christianity different are nonetheless still Christian. That's a beautiful thing. Number six, uh, I remind you of this. It should go without saying, but we'll go back to the beginning. The authority and lordship of Christ established in the resurrection outside that empty tomb and in the clouds of his bodily ascension into heaven, that lordship and authority are still the anchors of faith and mission. Jesus Christ proclaims the resurrection, his resurrection from the dead, and the church follows suit. Paul certainly does here in Acts chapter 28. That is his historical anchor. Those events, because they happened, they help us live in a vital way in our present historical moments. We don't forget them. Christian church is not built on great worship, spectacular singing, wonderful preaching, great buildings. It's not built on anything more than that Jesus Christ walked bodily out of a tomb after three days of being dead. He ascended into heaven to take his place at the right hand of God's throne. And as we say in the Apostles' Creed, he will come back to judge the living and the dead. Which brings us to our last and final and most appropriate point. Repentance, turning back to God. That is the ultimate hope. It is the one and only ask that is worthy of the Christian ministry. Everything that's written in the book of Acts, everything for which Paul labors, is a labor of love so that other people will turn away from sin and turn back toward God. And that's where I want to end tonight, is to simply make that invitation once again to you, that if you listening have not given your life to Christ, have not said in prayer to God, I want to turn away from the stuff of this world and I want to turn my attention, my eyes, my faith toward heaven. If you have not done that, then let's do that right now. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess that God acted in history through a man some 2,000 years ago, and after 30 to 33 years of living on this planet, he walked a lonely road in Jerusalem for one brutal week, and at the end of that week, gave his life in death on a cross so that the death penalty for sin we owed God would not have to be paid by us, but they would be paid in their entirety by that sinless soul whose arms stretched wide on the cross of Calvary. And three days later, miraculously, mysteriously, that 30 to 33-year-old man rose bodily from the grave, walked out of the tomb, established lordship over death, My death that I owed established lordship for every human being, including you, over death and then ascended into heaven until God would snap his fingers and say, let's bring this sinfully sad human history to an end and let's start over with a new heaven and a new earth and the restoration of all things as I originally intended them with Jesus Christ called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world by his sacrifice as that sacrificial lamb, the Lamb of God sitting at the center of heaven's throne. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. Confess him as your loving God. 
And know that as you do that, your life becomes hidden with Christ until the day he returns and raises us bodily from the grave so that we may live for eternity with him. This is the hope of the Christian church. This is the calling of the Christian ministry. It was the centerpiece of Paul's life in the book of Acts along with the other apostles. And it can be yours, it can be ours as well. As we wrap up the book of Acts today, would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Turn us away from our sins. Turn us fully to him who gave his life for the sins of the whole world. Taking our punishment on his shoulders, Heavenly Father, help us live in the freedom that he now gives us to live beyond sin, to live by faith, and to pursue what is good, led by your Holy Spirit. Bless the Christian church. Thank you for this shepherd ministry. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we close out a very hard 2020 year to look forward to your grace being renewed and anew in 2021. We bless your holy name. Thank you for your love for us in Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Shepherd family, wherever you are gathered, whether here in America, whether across the sea in Africa or Europe or South America or Asia, we are glad to have you on board. As you have opportunity, continue to show your support for our Shepherd ministry. Like us on social media. Financially support us through our shepherdaz.church website. I look forward to seeing you again soon. And if not so before, then after the new year. God bless you. And may you have a safe and happy Christmas. Thank you.